This Real Agriculture podcast is brought to you by Genesis Fertilizers. Nitrogen fertilizer is your farm's number one expense. Farmers are working together through Genesis Fertilizers to solve the problem of high prices and security of supply by planning a state-of-the-art nitrogen plant. Security and earnings through ownership is the solution. Visit Genesis today at genesisfertilizers.com to learn more. Good day and welcome to Wheat Beats Word here on Real Agriculture for Wednesday, January the 17th. On this episode of The Word, man, winter has arrived. Dang it. I'm not sure I like that. Hey, lots of yen learnings. We'll talk about that. Soils, tillage, and if I get to it at the end, soybean replants. I may not make it there, but who knows. Let's go. First off, yeah, baby, she is cold in Canada this week. Unbelievable. Not just Canada, but across the northern plains. It's minus 45 Celsius some places. That is really, really cold. Meanwhile, here in Ontario, lots of, of questions coming in. All right, Peter, so it's cold. So what does that do? I mean, it's minus 19 with a wind chill, minus 27. Is my wheat dead? So let's talk quickly about that because number one, we all know or we should know that wind chill doesn't matter. Plants really just feel the actual air temperature. It, they don't, ex- or at least the lethal temperature doesn't matter what the wind chill is. So take that one away. Number two, how much snow do you have? Because my farm, we have at least four inches of snow. That's a beautiful blanket. It can get much colder than minus 19 before we're going to damage anything underneath that blanket of snow. In fact, so far this winter, the warm temperatures of December and all that moisture has done way more to damage the wheat crop, at least at Lucan, than it ha- than this cold snap is going to do unless the snow goes away and we get really cold temperatures. But when I go down into Essex, and so Alex Knight tweeting out, you know, minus 19, the canola leaves are uh, uh, brittle, I think, or like the, the canola leaves were, were very, very frozen. So what are the lethal temperatures for alfalfa? It's about minus 12 Celsius, and that's what kills the crown on alfalfa. For winter canola, minus 18 Celsius. Remember, the, both alfalfa and winter canola, the crown is basically right at the soil surface. So if minus 18 is the lethal temperature, it's minus 19 with no snow, and there was almost no snow there. That's getting a little bit close for comfort. With winter wheat, it's minus 21. Depends on which report you you read. Some would say even minus 23. So wheat would still be okay at minus 19. Canola on the border, alfalfa, is likely hurt pretty badly from that standpoint. Hey, the upside is that when we get these really cold temperatures, it also kills some of the overwintering insects. And so at least, hopefully, some of those insect pests that would normally be a big issue, these cold temperatures, especially if you have no snow and they stay around for an extended period, they do tend to thin out the population, probably not take the population to zero, but uh, you gotta, you got to look at the bright side when you get this cold. All right, I want to talk quickly about Europe because, man, it is incredibly wet in Europe. The Netherlands, the, the wettest fall period on record from what I'm seeing com- coming across Twitter. Actually, John tweeting out a really great link to me. And, and if you get the chance to include Wheat Pete in a Twitter conversation that is cool, please do that. Or if you see something cool on there about agriculture, a tag in at Wheat Pete. Uh, John, sending me a nice little YouTube video or a link to a YouTube video. It was super wet. And they were still planting wheat and, and such an amount of tillage. It looked like they had moldboard plowed the field. And then they were going over it with a, a rotary hoe, like basically a, a, almost a big rototiller and 
beating it into, into some kind of shape, and the cedar was coming right behind that, that uh, rotavator. It was, it was massive tillage. It just kind of go like, oh, wow, massive tillage. We'll talk about t- uh, tillage a little bit later on this episode, but they, they are keen to get wheat in the ground. Well, it's really interesting, though, because when you add all of Europe and the UK up, they, they are big, big producers of wheat, and across that region, Germany's wet, France has been wet, the UK has been super wet, up through the Netherlands, uh, the, the amount of winter wheat that's got planted is significantly lower, which you would expect is going to have some impact on the supply in that region. I certainly know, after my trip to, to the UK, that in that part of the world, uh, they, they are going to have a lot less wheat harvested in 2024 than normal. No doubt about that. Hey, I'm at the Ontario Ag Conference uh, sessions. Yesterday, I was in Kempville. On Friday, I will be in Waterloo. All of the virtual sessions are available now from Ridgetown. So if you didn't know that, go to the web portal if you're registered. If you're not registered, you can still register for the virtual segment. There is so much good information. And we're going to be adding to everything that's there as we get the recorded sessions from Kempville. And once we get Waterloo through, going to be 60 or more sessions available there. An incredible amount of information. Get registered if you can at all. By the way, last episode, I talked about Tech Talk Tuesdays. And Lindsay Smith here from Real Agriculture said, Pete, What is that? I'm not 100% sure I know. So if you don't know what Tech Talk Tuesdays is, it's part of the Ontario Ag Conference. It's every Tuesday night through January and February, with the exception of last night because Kempville was live yesterday. And Wheat Pete is the moderator. We pick a topic. Next week will be Fertility Fanatics. And so we look at our program. We look at the ones related to fertility. We pick five or six of the key speakers from those sessions We have them on a Zoom call, and you can ask them questions in the chat about their presentations, about anything fertility. It goes for an hour and a half, an hour and a half from 7.27 till 9 p.m. It's just a great way to interact virtually when you don't get a chance in person. So, So Tech Talk Tuesday, you know, the Ag Conference, Ontario Ag Conference, one of those things that just keeps giving. It's it's sort of like Real Ag's agronomists, except we only do it for a very short period, and the questions are, are were really related back to the presentations that were made at the Ag Conference. All right, I want to just throw out a quick thank you to Ava. What, what a great email Ava sent me. She is a first-year crop technology student from Lakeland College, and she just wanted to thank me for doing the word. She said, you often ask for constructive criticism. Well, I was raised not only to give constructive criticism, but also to give credit where credit is due, and I I'm a faithful listener to the word. You've taught me so much as a a person just getting into agriculture. Thank you for that. And please keep it up. So, wow, that makes Wheat Pete feel good. And, And it is true, as Nature Nut Nick would say, if you can encourage someone, you absolutely will get far more productivity from them. They'll feel better than when you come in and the first words out of your mouth are negative. It's never good. So just as you go forward, try to remember that. It's a great life lesson, no question about that. And thank you, Ava, for the very kind comments. All right, let's get into some agronomy. Jason sending me an email saying, Peter, So I'm pricing clover seed like I love putting clover into wheat. Boy, clover seed has gotten expensive, pushing around $3 per pound, I think he said. But he said, what about coated clover seed? So Jason, we have had this discussion before, and I have seen no studies. We've done lots of work on clover. We do not see a benefit to coated clover seed. Essentially, you're getting about 30% less seed or something like that in terms of the, the amount of coating that is on that seed. For my money, I'm buying uncoated clover seed. I just don't see the benefit. And for the people selling coated clover seed, by golly, send me the data because if I'm wrong, I want to know. But but we have tri- done trials, coated versus uncoated. I had a client actually that did that last year. We saw zero difference. Might as well just buy the straight seed. Okay, I want to move on to the yen. And oh my gosh, so there's an article out there that is talking about yen and it says that the winners all broadcast their wheat seed 
into standing soybeans or at least broadcast their wheat seed. That is not the case. So let's just say no, no, no. Uh, Mark Davis broadcast his wheat into his standing soybeans and Mark seems to get away with that. If you recall, Johnson is out of that game because we can't have treated wheat seed in the, the soybeans we harvest and we've seen too many cases of that happen in the 2023 soybean harvest. We had lots of broadcast soy, or wheat into soybeans last fall. It looked like it, it was a, a management technique that could really work for late, late harvested soybeans. Nope. Way too many treated wheat situations in, in soybeans. We can't have that. And we can't use untreated wheat seed because then bunt can wipe out the entire crop. So, Mark, you get away with it. That's awesome. Keep doing it. I don't know what's different in your situation. If we could figure that out, I'd love it. But from a general recommendation standpoint, we aren't going to do that. But what I will say is it's really interesting in the yen data that a lot of the repeat winners and a lot of the top growers are narrow row wheat. And we've looked at broadcast wheat. I mean, we've had presentations where, where other growers will broadcast their wheat and just work it in with a high-speed disc. We had this discussion at Lambton Soil and Crop on Friday. It has to be a high-speed disc. And my good friend Ryan Benjamins, what a great agronomist from Lambton County, because I said... You know, back in the day, we would broadcast wheat and run over it with a cultivator, but I didn't think the cultivator was giving us good enough seed to soil contact. And Ryan says, not only that, it might be partly that, whereas a high speed disc, because it runs on the rollers at the back, all the weight is carried on the rollers at the back, we get much better seed firming. But the other thing is that the disc mixes that seed into the soil, whereas a cultivator, because the cultivator shank parts that soil, it throws the seed each way, and we actually get almost rows where we get lots of seed in between the cultivator shanks and not so much right where the cultivator shank is. And so that might be part of why the cultivator doesn't work as well as the high-speed disc. The other trend in the yen competition is the number of growers who are at the top using five inch wheat is pretty significant. From a proportion of entrants, it's fairly low. From a proportion of winners, it's fairly high. And I scratch my head. I know the Michigan data says that there's some yield benefit there for sure, but Shane and I did some trials. We didn't see that. And then I look at the German research that says that if two seeds are closer than one centimeter, two wheat seeds closer than one centimeter, that they will compete with each other. Hmm, one centimeter, half an inch, spill drill. How often do we get that, that wheat seed not to be in bunches? Never. But the winners are often at a low seeding rate in five inch spacings. Jeff Crone, perfect example, 0.9 million seeds per acre, five inch spacing. A lot of less seeds there are going to be within one centimeter of each other, plus broadcast wheat and run over it with a high-speed disc. Man, none of those wheat seeds should be closer than one centimeter. So that is kind of a cool learning when we think about what we're, we're seeing in that whole yen discussion. Bernie calling me up and saying, Pete, I, I watched Josh Naselski in your presentation on the wheat nitrogen uptake. Man, that does not drive me to split nitrogen. And it, like, oh, that's uptake is so early. Why would I bother to split nitrogen? Bernie, you're 100% right. In all of our data, it's the exception when split nitrogen increases wheat yield. However, split nitrogen is less lodging. And split nitrogen, I can, I can target my nitrogen rate a little bit better, and it's better for the environment. So there's some reasons to split. Interestingly enough, the top yen growers, most of them are splitting their nitrogen, and I think they're doing that to try to target the nitrogen rate better. But the big shot, based on, on Shane and my data, that nutrient uptake stuff, it really needs to be there by growth stage 30 or 31 for sure. And by the way, the article I talked about that said broadcast wheat, a grower in there talked about early nitrogen and putting it on the snow. Everybody better be saying, oh, Pete's going to go on a rampage. He's going to go on a rant. No, 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 no nitrogen on snow. We know that data. It doesn't work. You get 
big losses. The snow melts. The nitrogen goes where, whoever ever knows where, but not where you want it to be, uniformly applied on the f field. Just like no manure on snow, no nitrogen on snow. And so Diego saying, hey, Peter, what are the top five things to growing a big wheat crop? And Diego, I'm going to go throw right back at you because that list will depend on what is most limiting in that wheat field to begin with. So there's some givens. If you don't, if you don't have good base soil fertility, you are, that's going to limit your wheat yield. If you don't pick the right planting date, that's going to limit your wheat field. But when you say, what are the top five factors, they are probably going to be different for every field. And this goes right back to a, a great tweet that Dr. Dave put out uh, early, about a week ago, and, and his comment was, you know, maybe the, rather than talking about soil health or trying to figure out soil health scores, what we should be looking at is what is the most limiting soil function on that field? And it's going to be different on every field. On a heavy clay soil, it's going to maybe be surface drainage. On a good clay loam, it's maybe going to be tile drainage. On a, a, an old pasture field that hasn't had any fertility forever, maybe it is soil fertility. So it really does come down to that individual field and what soil function. Dr. Dave listed 10, a few people in the Twitter feed added a few more. There's, there's many different functions that the soil does, provides nutrients, holds the plant up, soil water holding capacity, biology, lots of different things. But it really does come down to that one, like what is the thing that was limiting you before, that is the thing that you have to fix. Hey, another tweet Dr. Dave put out, he was pretty disappointed, his wheat field along his tree line, and man, the trees were just, for the, it depended on where, it was not even, but uh, looked like 30 feet in in some cases, the wheat was just, just very poor from the trees taking all the moisture. And I'm thinking, wow, with all the moisture we had this fall, you would have expected it not to have quite as much impact. But the outcome of that discussion, and I, I'd thought of it before, but it really resonated in my mind because since I've started strip tilling, and I strip till with an Orthman one stripper, it has a shank, goes six inches deep, I don't see the impact, that significant impact along the tree line coming into the field nearly as much. And it's because we're pruning the roots so I think you should be careful how close you prune those roots to those trees. But the discussion was a one shank deep ripper that you go along maybe 10 feet away from the trees. So you prune those roots. They don't come out as far. They don't have the big negative impact. And then you can actually get more of the benefit from the trees holding that wind back. And I know my great friend Rob Templeman is going to be just saying, take the trees out. No, maybe we can manage them. Although tree roots and tile drains is, is another definite issue that we, we need to, to worry about. In the UK, they would just say, plant that first 30 feet to, to a wildflowers, to rewilding. And, and by the way, the government there would pay them to do that. And that's another solution. No question about that. Hey, while we're on tillage, a great discussion at Elgin Soil and Crop. Trevor, in, uh, in his trials, a one bushel yield gain to no-till versus a spring disc on triticale stubble. And one bushel, by the way, is the same. I am not trying to say it, that that yield difference is real. But no yield loss to no-till. Economically, huge win to no-till. Chris showed different data where he lost three bushels to no-till versus where he ran over with a high-speed disc. And that wasn't triticale stubble. That was, that was, I think, 240 or 250 bushel corn residue. We had a great discussion about that. That three bushels is still break-even from running over that, that soil or that field with that high-speed disc. I know that, that Larry is still frustrated with Horst Bonner for saying he was done with no-till. For most growers, if you're doing some spring tillage, it's, it's probably rarely economic, or you're doing some tillage on corn stalks, but what it, it does do is it, it just gives you a little bit better feeling. I'm not sure long-term it does us a whole lot of good, but those tillage numbers and what is best, man, it's all in the eye of the beholder. It is a great discussion. With that, I am 
out of time. I'm not going to get to Horst and Bob Thurwall's discussion about soy replants for the second word episode in a row, but we'll keep it on the list. That's it. That's all on behalf of the team here at Real Agriculture. This is Wheat Pete with the word for Wednesday, January the 17th. Hey, keep the messages, the comments coming, and I'll keep talking next week. See you then. <laughs>